Good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. Thank you for joining us on today. We at the Davis household, we are celebrating. And guess what? You get to join in on the celebration. On today, 20 years ago, Pastor Matthew Alexander Davis and I were married at Brown Baptist Church in South Haven, Mississippi. Yes, God has kept us together for 20 years. And guess what? He is still keeping us together. Our scripture for today is Psalm 116, 1 through 5, and then 12 through 13. I love the Lord because he hears my voice in my prayer for mercy. Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Death wrapped its ropes around me. The terrors of the grave overtook me. I saw only trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Please, Lord, save me. How kind the Lord is. How good he is. So merciful, this God of ours. What can I offer to the Lord for all he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and praise the Lord's name for saving me. Our song is, What Shall I Render? All I have is my body and my soul. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father, for sparing our lives one more time. We thank you for your mercy, Father God. We thank you for keeping us that you did not allow justice to take hold. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for being merciful to us to the point, Father, 
We realize that we should have been dead and gone. We should have been sleeping in our grave. But mercy and your grace took over. And we thank you for it. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for not doing the things that are pleasing in your sight. Bless us tonight, Father God, as we study your word. That your word will become real to us. That we will walk in your word. And that your word, Father God, will empower us. We ask you to keep us now. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Tell me why. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much again for joining us for our, our Bible study on tonight. Joining us by our remote location one more time. Thank you so much. We have completed Philippians, the book of Philippians. We are now complete with the book of Philippians. We have walked uh, some two months, almost three months through the book of Philippians. And now you are certified in the book of Philippians. Thank you so much. So tonight we're going to slow down a little bit and we're going to talk about the book of Philippians again. Some of you, two of you, have sent in questions uh, at the right time. Two of you sent in questions and, and we appreciate you. Uh, Sister Diane Henry, thank you for sending in questions and and Sister, Sister Lydian Darrington, thank you for sending in questions. We're going to cover those questions. Two of those questions by these two people were the same question. So we'll cover these questions on tonight. And uh, hopefully you can walk with us and, and stick with us as we go through this book tonight. The whole book of Philippians we will cover tonight based on your questions. Thank you so much. First question that we look at tonight uh, is found in, in chapter 1, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Uh, Philippians in the New Testament, chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. We know that Paul is in prison, or some theologians call it house arrest. We know that Paul is, is in prison for sharing the word of God. He's in prison. He's locked up. He didn't do anything wrong, but he did things right to get locked up. Let me just say to you today, even in the 21st century that we live in today, you can get locked up for doing what's right. The problem with the 21st century church is that we are not adamant about sharing Christ. Paul was adamant about sharing Christ. The Apostle Paul was excited about sharing Christ. The Apostle Paul was just enthusiastic and he had passion. He had passion, great passion, when he shared Christ. So the Apostle Paul here is locked up in a Roman's jail or he's on house arrest. He's in a prison, but we do know regardless of whether he is on house arrest or locked in a prison as we know it today, he has people that are guarding him. The guards are with him. We realize that he's being guarded. Now, Paul has an uncertain future here. He has a future that he doesn't know about. He is locked up in prison and he's sentenced to die. He's on death row. I've asked you a number, a number of times uh, before, if you were on death row, would you be thinking about writing a letter to help somebody else do better? <laughs> if you were on death row, would you think about talking about Jesus Christ and what he has already done? If you were on death row, would you be witnessing to Jesus Christ? I doubt it for many of us that we would be concerned about witnessing to Jesus through Jesus Christ, because you know what? We have the freedom to witness today, and we don't do it adamantly. We don't do it constructively. We are not adamant about sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Let me just say to you today, if men are going to be saved, if our world is going to be changed, we have to become more adamant about Jesus Christ and his finished work on Calvary. We have to become adamant about sharing it. Every day, almost nearly every day, uh, many of you get robocalls. And these robocalls are trying to sell you something, they're trying to get you to buy something, or they're trying to get you to invest in something, or they're trying to get you to get a new credit card. I received two such calls today. And they have numbers that look familiar to your number. 
They have numbers that look familiar to government phone numbers where you would be adamant about, about answering the phone call. And they begin by saying, hi. And they pause for a moment and then they say, if you want to, you want to reduce your interest rate on your, your credit card, the moment they say credit card, I hang up. Because I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I have no credit cards with any balances on them. I know that they, this is the robocall. This is not a call to me personally because I don't deal with credit cards where I need to go from one place to the other, one card to the other, chase one interest rate after the other. So I know that's a robocall and I know it's not meant for me. It's meant for me, but it's not to me. So I hang up. But the moment you have a robocall and it's not a machine, but it is a person, it's a good opportunity for you to witness for Jesus Christ. I had a call one day and when I, when I got this call, the lady was so persistent in selling me some land in Florida, selling me a vacation, selling me a spot that I can go to anywhere in the world. First of all, don't give your credit card and don't give your money to anybody you can't shake hands with. <laughs> don't give your information out to anybody that you don't know. The problem is we share our personal information with people we've never seen and we trust them with our personal business. Social security number, address, phone number, how many children we have, how old they are, how long we've been living there. And then some people will even share their bank accounts. I'm saying to you, whenever you get a person on the phone and they just won't get off the phone, it's time for you to talk to them about Jesus. This lady that I talked to, I asked her one question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Sir, I'm calling you to give you a good deal. And it sounds like a good deal. I said, well, my question to you is, do you know Jesus Christ? My next question is, where do you go to church? My next question to you is, uh, have you confessed Christ as your Savior? Let me tell you, she wanted all the answers from me, but she wanted to give me no answers. Let me just say to you, we need to become more adamant about soul winning for Jesus Christ. This is a case here in Philippians. In Philippians, the apostle Paul is concerned about winning souls to Christ. He's concerned about the unity of the body of Christ. He's concerned about people who are living their lives right <laughs> as far as Jesus Christ is concerned. Let's look at it. The first question comes from Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. The question is, why did the Apostle Paul say that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill? Let me just say to you, we know that the Apostle Paul is locked up in prison. Paul is writing a letter to the church at Philippi. The church of Philippi is that one church that is known to support Paul spiritually. They are known to support Paul physically and financially. So we're looking at first, we're looking at Philippians chapter one, verses 15 through 20. So they, they are, the question has been asked, the question has been asked that if, if somebody, if somebody uh, uh, preaching and they're preaching for selfish gain, there's preaching in envy. Let's see what the apostle Paul says. Let's see, let's see what he says. Verse number 15. He says, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach, the former meaning the ones who preach for goodwill, the former preach Christ from selfish ambitions. The former, the former preach Christ from selfish ambition. No, he's talking about the ones that, that preach Christ through envy and strife. He's saying they are not sincere, they not sincerely in their preaching, then they preach Christ through selfish ambition, not sincerely supporting to add affliction, supposing to add affliction to my chains. He's saying that there's a group of people who just like some preachers today, even in the 21st century, they are not preaching for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be spreading. 
They are preaching, as he says here, for selfish ambition. One of the words he used is envy. He used the word envy. This word envy means jealousy. This word envy means strife. This word means selfishness. Some even preach, as this word envy means, ill will. So there are actually some preachers, Paul is saying, of his day, there are some preachers that preached out of envy, out of jealousy, out of spite, out of ill will, out of selfishness. This is a reality in Paul's day. These men, I say, was preaching in the flesh. They were not preaching in the spirit. They were not following the, the God that we serve. They were preaching out of the flesh. Now, let's look at this. They are preachers. It's not a question of whether or not they're called by God to preach. The question is, are they doing what God has called them to do with the right heart? So we know here that Paul is not talking about the Judaizers. For the Judaizers that he talks about in Philippians, the Judaizers were that group of people who thought that you could be saved by way of the Old Testament in Paul's day, as well as they think that in our day. So the Judaizers thought that the Old Testament was the, was the law by which men ought to be saved. Well, in Paul's days, in Paul days, Jesus Christ had already come. Jesus Christ is the only way for us to have salvation. Jesus Christ is the only way for us to get to God. Mm -hmm. And because Jesus Christ is the only way for us to get to God, the Judaizers were not on the right page. Mm -hmm. They did not have the right doctrine. However, the men that he talks about in verses 15 and 16 are not Judaizers. These men that he's talking about, they have the right doctrine. They've been called by God to preach. They are preaching Jesus Christ, but they have the wrong motive. Mm -hmm. God is concerned about what you do, but he's also concerned about your motives. What are your motives? What's your motive for, the, for what you do? What is your motive for how you handle things? What, is, what turns you on? What, what goal are you seeking? Paul says in verses 15 and 16, he said, there are some men who are not sincere. There are some men who are, who, who are, are preaching for the wrong reason. There are some men who are preaching out of envy and strife. This word strife simply means they're preaching for rivalry. They are preaching out of competition. They are preaching for the wrong reason. Paul says when they are preaching, they don't have God on their mind. They have themselves in mind. It's much kin to those who preach for, for financial gain. Now, I did not say that the preacher should not have financial gain through his preaching, for Paul preaches the whole and teaches the whole book of Philippians, and he talks about how preachers should live off that he dispenses. Matthew says in his gospel that you should not muzzle the ox. If he threads out the corn, he ought to also eat of the corn. Mm -hmm. The man of God who delivers the gospel ought to also live from the gospel. Mm -hmm. So he, he's saying to us today, that people are preaching out of competition. Mm -hmm. They are preaching for the wrong reason. They, are, they have selfish gain in mind. And because they are preaching out of selfish gain, their ambition is to have something for themselves. Mm -hmm. And they are not preaching the word of God as the word of God should be preached with the right motives. Mm -hmm. Let's look further. Verse 16, he says, the former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my, my, my chains. Paul says, these guys that are preaching through selfish ambition, these guys who are preaching through envy, these guys who are preaching through strife, they really want to get back at him. 
So what they're doing is they are preaching and the people of the world are watching their preaching, watching their mannerism, and they're saying Paul is just like them. They're saying that you can't trust one preacher, so what make you want to trust another? Paul says they are preaching to add affliction. They are preaching to make my way hard. Mm -hmm. They don't preach with sincerity. <laughs> they don't preach for for the right reason. Then he says the latter. He says, but the latter out of love. He says the second group that he talks about, that those who are preaching, that the, those who are, are preaching out of goodwill, those who are preaching out of goodwill, the latter are preaching out of love. So you have these guys that's preaching for selfish gain. Then you have these guys that are preaching out of love. He's saying the guys who are preaching out of love are who I'm talking about now. He says, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The second group that is preaching out of love, these are preaching with the right motive. They love the Lord. They are preaching the right gospel as the others were. They are preaching the right gospel, but their motive is to bring men, women, boys, and girls to Christ. The reason why we stand on Wednesday, Tuesday, the reason why we stand on Sunday is so men, women, boys, and girls can come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That's why we cannot abandon the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Too often men who are standing in the pulpit have abandoned the gospel of Jesus Christ. They preach everything but the gospel. They, they preach Trump. They, they preach the, the Essen magazine. They preach Jet magazine. They preach the forward time. They preach news. They preach CNN, but they do not stop by the gospel. Mm -hmm. It's a sad day when you're called to preach and you don't preach what God has given you to preach. And the gospel is the good news. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have to always be willing to preach and teach the gospel. So the next time you get a caller that's calling you to try to sell you something or convince you to take a chance on this or that, first of all, let them know that Jesus died over 2,000 years ago. Let them know that he rose with all power in his hand. And if they stay on the phone long enough, let them know that he died not only for you, but that he died for them also. Yes. Now, do you want to get to know him? <laughs> you can get to know him right now, right here. So Paul says, some people are preaching out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So they're preaching out of love. They have a love not only for the gospel, not only for God, but also for Paul. Whenever we preach, whenever we teach, however we live, it ought to be for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 18, Paul, Paul asks this question, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this, I rejoice. Yes. I will rejoice. Mm -hmm. Paul says, whether they preach for the right reason or whether they preach for the wrong reason, I'm going to rejoice about it because Jesus Christ is being preached. Yes, it's a sad day when preachers have to down each other to look good. It's a sad day when preachers have to talk about each other in order for them to look like they got something going for themselves. Let me just share with you today. Uh, you don't have to down anybody else's gift. There are enough unsaved people out here everywhere for everybody to be preaching Jesus to. Yes, it's a sad day when the associate ministers think that the pastor is doing them wrong because he won't let them preach in the pulpit. Well, let me just share with you today, the pastor is not preaching in the pulpit. <laughs> Matter of fact, the pastor hadn't preached in the pulpit since probably the, the second, third Sunday in, in March. So what have you done, brother preacher? What have you done with your gift that God has given you? It, God has not called us to the pulpit alone. God has also called us 
to the street. Can't you hear Jesus saying, go to the hedges and the highway and, and invite them to come? Mm -hmm. We have to get to a point in our lives, and God has brought us to this point now, where we're not doing church like we used to. Mm -hmm. And if you're saved, you don't have to be a preacher to deliver the word of God. Yes, you don't have to be called to, to some title to deliver the word of God. Now I ask associate ministers all over the world, what are you doing with your gift now? Since the pastor, since the pastor was holding you back when he was preaching in the pulpit, what are you doing with your gift since the pulpit is not available to any of us? What are you doing now? I say to you, Sunday school teacher, where are you teaching now? I say to you, Bible study teacher, where are you teaching now? I say to you, if you got a gift, if you were a greeter, you ought to be greeting people with a smile. Mm -hmm. You ought to be treating people neighborly. You, you ought to be encouraging people if you are an encourager in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Don't wait till the church becomes church as you used to know it in order for you to exercise your gift. Because we may not ever see church as we used to know it again. The city of Houston is still rising in cases of COVID-19. The state of Texas had another, another day. Now up to over 8,000 COVID cases in one single day in one state. We may not ever see church like we've seen church before, but we still need to be calling men to Christ Jesus and telling them, about the Christ who died and rose again. Mm -hmm. So look at verses verses uh, 19 through 20. Paul continued his dialogue. He says, for to know that this will turn for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. He's still talking about these preachers. He's still talking about those who preach in vain, <laughs> those who preach for the wrong reasons, those who preach with the wrong motive. You need to know one thing, Paul says, hopefully this will turn out for my deliverance. Mm -hmm. This word deliverance is salvation. This word deliverance is rescue. The word deliverance is safety. The word deliverance is to, a, to deliver, deliverance of my help and deliverance of me being vindicated. Mm -hmm. Paul says, let them keep right on preaching. If they're preaching Jesus, they're preaching the right gospel. He says, if they're preaching Jesus, they're preaching the right gospel, let them go on and preach because this may be a blessing to me and it may come to my deliverance. Mm -hmm. Through your prayers, Philippians, through your prayers and through the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, I can get delivered through this. Let me just share with you. If you're going to be physical delivered, you need to be delivered through Christ. Yes. If you're going to be morally delivered, you got to be delivered through Christ. If you're going to be, if you're going to be spiritual delivered, surely there's no other means of your deliverance other than through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ himself. Mm -hmm. So he closes out in verse number 20. By saying, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I should be, shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul is saying to us, and he continues this, this same scenario, talking about the fact that we need to understand that God has a way of delivering us even in the midst of other folk doing the wrong thing. Yes. He says uh, with, with boldness, Christ is being magnified. He says, I have a great expectation. I have an earnest expectation and I have a hope. Paul saying that I'm not going to be ashamed of any of it. He also, he backs this up in Romans chapter one, verse 16, where he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God 
unto salvation to the Greek and to the, to the Jew, then to the Greek and to the Jew. He's saying that he will not be ashamed. He has nothing to be ashamed of. Too often we are too ashamed of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Too often we are ashamed of what God is doing in our lives. Too often we are ashamed of the church. We are ashamed of the God that we serve. Let me tell you, if you are ashamed to own him on planet earth, he will be ashamed to own you in heaven before his father. Yes. He'll be ashamed. Don't, don't be ashamed. And then Paul goes on verse number 21. He says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul says, if I keep living, I'm going to exemplify Christ in my physical body while I'm here on planet earth. If I die, I'm going to die, and that's going to be gain. In other words, you, what Paul is saying, I want to be here with you. I expect to be here. I have great hope. I have great expectation to be here with you. But if I live, I'm going to live with God on my heart, and I am going to glorify God, and to live for me is Christ. Yes. You see, the problem is people think they're living, but they're just existing. They're just existing. They're just existing. If you're going to really live, you need Christ Jesus on your side. Amen. If you're going to really live, if you're going to really live to, to great expectations, you need Jesus Christ in your life. Regardless of how you're doing things now, if you don't have Christ, you're just existing. You need Christ in your life. And then he says, if I die, it is gain. For to me to live is Christ. For me to die is gain. In other words, I have gained eternal life in heaven. I have gained, I have glorified, I have a glorified body. Mm -hmm. I have gained glorification because for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I have no more problems, no more troubles, no more situations that I can't deal with, no more backbiting. I'm going to a place of no more because now it is gain for me mm -hmm. if I die. Paul says it doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter. Now he talks more about the fact that I'm hard pressed on, on both sides. He says, verse, verse 22, he says, but if, but, but if I live in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. Paul saying that I don't know what's going on now. He says, he says, it's going to be fruit for you. It's going to be a blessing for me. It's going to be a blessing for you if I stay here. Let me tell you, when the preacher is talking to you, it's a blessing for you. <laughs> when the word of God is going out, it's a blessing for you. It's your gain. He says, he said, this means fruit from my labor. God blesses us based on the fruit that we have from, from the labor that we have performed. You ought to be working for the Lord and strengthening the Lord and walking, walking in the Lord. Goes on to say, not only will it be fruitful of my labor, yet what shall I choose? And then goes on in, in verse number 23, he says, for I am hard pressed between the two, having to desire to the, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. He said, I, I'm caught up between living on earth and living in heaven. He says that it doesn't matter if I live, I'm going to live to Christ. He says it doesn't matter if I die, I'm going to die in Christ. Yes. But if I die, I'm going to be far better off in heaven. Mm -hmm. He says, which is better? Verse number 24, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needed for you. I told you, he, he said, he said you, would be, you would have a reason to celebrate if I keep living. Let me tell you, somebody is depending on your testimony. Somebody is depending on you sharing Christ. And while you're here, they're being blessed by your presence, blessed by your testimony, blessed because of Christ Jesus in you. He says, but I'm caught up between the two. And I know you need me. Verse 20, 25 and 26, he says, in being confident of this, I know I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress in the joy of faith. I know I'm, I'm going to stay. He's, he's talking in faith now. He knows that he has a death sentence. He knows that sharing the word of God has gotten him in trouble. <laughs> he knows that he's in prison and he has a death sentence to die. 
but he is confident of this very thing that it is going to be help for you. And I'm going to give in to your progress. Your progress will be great and your joy of faith will be great. That you're rejoicing, verse 26, that you're rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Christ Jesus by my coming to you again. Saying you're going to have rejoicing. You're going to rejoice in Christ Jesus by coming, coming, by my coming again. Let's look, let's, let's move now to uh, Philippians chapter, Philippians chapter 20, chapter four, verses one through three. Philippians chapter four, verses one through three. Philippians chapter four. Let's back up before we go there. That, that same question dealt, dealt with the envy and the strife that was found in Philippians chapter one, verses 15. We went from 15 to 26, so it, it, it answered that question. And let's look at Philippians chapter four, verses one through three. Philippians chapter four, verses one through three. Now the question is, we all have come from different backgrounds. We all have different opinions. We all come from different situations. And because we come from different situations, how in the world, tell me preacher, the question is, how in the world do you expect, how do you expect us to get along in church? <laughs> we have different backgrounds and I'm paraphrasing this question. How can we as a group of people with different backgrounds get along with each other if we are so diversified? Well, let's look at Philippians chapter four, verses one through three. Uh, Paul is writing to the church at Philippi and he's saying to them, y'all got to get along. <laughs> he's saying get along and he points out the way we go, we, he wants us to get along. He's talking to two women. Therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown, so stood fast, so, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Verse two, it's Philippians chapter four, verse two. He says, I implore you, Odia, and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. First thing he says, the way we're going to get along, it would be of the same mind. <laughs> he says, now these two women, let me give you a little background. These two women got issues. <laughs> you, you know any women in church that got issues? These two women have issues and they have issues with one another. They have problems with each other. You ever been at a church? I know not at your church, but at the other church down the street, around the corner, that kind of church. At the other church, have you ever seen two women or two men or two children in the church that got problems? They got issues with each other. Paul calls them by name. Paul doesn't go in and spray the whole congregation and accuse the whole congregation. What Paul does, he addressed these women by name, Euodia and Syntyche. He says, he says I'm, I'm imploring you, I'm begging you, I'm telling you to get it right. I'm asking Euodia and Syntyche to have the same mind to make sure you get on one accord. Mm -hmm. I urge you to be on one accord. I, uh, I urge you to have the same mind in the Lord. Have the same mind. You got to learn to think alike as children of the most high God. You got to get on one accord. You got to have the same mind. And when you have the same mind, your little selfish ways go out the window. The only reason why people have difficulties is because somebody want to have their way. Right. Somebody want to have their way. Pastor Alvin Molden said it well, and I heard him say this 21 years ago. Pastor Alvin Molden says, he says, the reason why we have issues is because there's a little boy locked up in me. There's a little girl locked up in you. And that little boy and that little girl want to have their way. 
And because no one will, will stand down, no one will let the other one have his or her way, then there's a standoff. Pastor Alvin Moden says we got we to gotta suppress, we got to get rid of the little boy and the little girl in us. Yes, I was listening to the man the other day, 45, 46 minus one. I was listening to him yesterday, and, and uh, it was a, a replay of the tape over and over again. You know, he's monopolizing the news now. And he says, I can't see myself wearing a mask. He says, because I can't see myself sitting behind the great desk in the Oval Office, talking to kings and queens and other presidents. I can't see myself with a mask on sitting behind the desk. Well, first of all, you don't need to wear a mask when you're by yourself. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you don't need to wear a mask when you're on the telephone. But you do need to wear a mask when you're in public when you're around other people. And it doesn't matter whether it's kings or queens because the fact of the matter is God can shut any of our breath off at any given time. So today he, the, he addressed the mask situation again. And he said that, yeah, I've worn a mask before and, and I look pretty good in a mask. Let me tell you something. A 13-year-old, a 10-year-old, a five-year-old is concerned about whether or not I look good in a mask. Because many times five-year-olds don't understand the danger that we talk about, that we've engaged in from day to day. So he's more concerned about how he look, which is not a good, a easy on the eye looking guy anyway. I mean, he's not, a, he's not an attractive man anyway, but he's concerned about how he looked behind the mask. Matter of fact, he may look a little better with the mask off <laughs> or with the mask on. He may look a lot better with the mask on. So, so we find ourselves, God says to us, be of the same mind. So the answer to the question, how can we get along? One way we can get along is find common ground, and that common ground ought to be in the Lord. We have to find ourselves of the same, of the same mind. Find ourselves of the same, same mind. Verse number three tells us another step that we need to take to find ourselves of the same mind and get along. Verse number three, Philippians chapter four says, and I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labor with me in the gospel with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. Now, first of all, he says in verse number two, you all need to have a, have a, a come to Jesus meeting. If you got issues, you all need to sell those issues. Mm -hmm. If you got issues, you all need to be of the same mind. Secondly, he says, in verse number three, he says, look, I'm talking to you all who are true companions. You all who are really saved. You all who are of the body of Christ. He says, I want you all to make sure, and I urge you all to help these women. Not only, not only these two women, you older you as well as Syntyche, you need to help these two women. First of all, help these women. They're struggling. Mm -hmm. They have issues. They are struggling. Let me tell you, if you're not right with the Lord, you're struggling. And sometimes you just can't come together and get on the same accord with the same mind. You need to call on the brothers, the companions, the sisters, the companions of the church, those who are born again, those who are saved, and, and help these women. Help these men help these children. The good thing about growing up in the country, you find out very soon that you're part of a village and it takes this whole village to rear just one child. And it didn't matter whether the Clarks saw me or the Carriers saw me or the Weeks saw me. It didn't matter who the parents were that saw me. I had to get in line if they told me to get in line. It's a village. Everybody, the church is a fellowship. The church is a, a family. Paul says the other way to solve issues in the church is that we get with them and help them. 
We get with them and we associate ourselves with them so much so until we can lead them, till we can be a blessing to them. And don't put 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 gasoline on the fire. Help put the fire out. Oftentimes, tell deacons that deacons in installation services uh, and ordination services. I oftentimes tell deacons that that you are firefighters. You are here to put the fire. You are not here to start the fire, and you are not here to keep the fire burning. You are here to put the fire out. I say to you as saints of God, if you're born again, you are here to put the flames out. Yes. You have been employed, and I implore you, I beg you, I urge you, don't gossip and put more flame, more, more gasoline on the fire don't backbite and put more gasoline on the fire. Whatever you do, help put the fire out. Paul's saying also to us is that, that we can't ignore the fire. We can't say it's not my business. We got to make sure that we structure our lives where people will respect us enough. When we come to them and hold them accountable, then they will understand that we're really trying to put the fire out. Look at Philippians chapter chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. First of all, he says to these two women, y'all come together on one accord. Secondly, he says, those who are true companion, those who are really saved, those in the body of Christ, y'all help these women out. Goes on to say, even, even bless those who labored with me in the gospel. Paul is saying there are some women and there are some men that supported me in the gospel. There are some women and there are some men who supported me with Clement also in the rest of the fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. Let me give you these three things and I'll leave you alone. First of all, we have to be on one accord. If we're going to deal with the scrimmages in church, if we're going to deal with how to get along, even though we have different perspectives of life, even though we have great divisions in life, even though we have great diversities and we came from different backgrounds, mm -hmm. we still serve the same God. Mm -hmm. Paul says in, in verse number two, he says, Euodia and Syntyche, y'all get it together. Come together one-on-one. -on -one. Matthew picks this thought up in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 15. Matthew picks this thought up in, in his gospel writing. He said, if you have a problem with the brother, you go to him one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Then he says, if you and that brother or sister can't fix the problem, you take two or three others with you. Then he says, if you all can't fix the problem with two or three others, then you take it before the church. Whoa, wait a minute. Hold up right here now. Let me just let you know that this is a long process. You don't go to the brother today and you can't sell it. Then you take somebody with you tomorrow and then you take them to the church the next Sunday. This is a long process. This is a, a healing process. This is a process where we come together because God's objective is, is that we all come to the unity of the faith of Jesus Christ. God's objective is that we have reconciliation. Mm -hmm. He wants us to reconcile. He doesn't want us to make it to the church where the church has to let us go as a heathen. He wants us to reconcile. So the first thing he says is that you two get together. When you have a problem, you go to a brother and sister and you get together. The second thing he says that the church has to hold us accountable. He says, you all help these sisters out. Y'all help these women out. Not only these women, there are some more people who have, who have been with me in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Y'all support them also. You see, the ministry ought to be, the church ought to be a support mechanism. The ministry ought to be a place where we talk about God and not by each other. The minute, whenever you see somebody who speaks more about other folk than they talk about God, that's a problem in the church. Whenever you see somebody who finds a problem with everything that goes on in the church, that's a problem with them. 
Matter of fact, for young boys and young girls, you ought to be inventors. You ought to be scientists. You ought to be technicians. You, you ought to be somebody that's dreaming every day. You ought to have goals. And you ought to talk more about your goals than you talk about people. Yes. Regardless of what you see from the older people, you ought to talk more about reaching your goals than you talk about each other. So first of all, he says, you all come together and be on one accord. Secondly, he says, the church has to hold these women accountable and hold everybody accountable. And then <clears throat> be a blessing to those who have shared with me in the gospel. Be a blessing to them. Be a blessing to them and, and support them. And he says, and the rest of the fellow workers, the last thing he says is, their names are written in the Lamb Book of Life. You ought to govern yourself as your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank God that we can govern ourselves as our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. I think I've, I've, I've uh, answered all of your questions, and, and it's good to fall out and stop right here on this one statement. Your name needs to be written in the book of life. Those of us who are born again, our names are now written in the Lamb's book of life. If you're not saved, this is your moment. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You can get to know Jesus. I know you've seen some things that, that have disappointed you in church. I know you've heard some things from church members I know that you've seen some struggles from members of the church. But you need your name written in the book of life. But you can only get it there by confessing Jesus Christ as your Savior. By confessing Christ as your Lord. I give you the invitation today to get to know Jesus. Get to know him personally, get to know him intimately, get to know him dearly. This is your moment to guarantee yourself a name, your name in the Lamb Book of Life. You can be saved, you can be born again, even on the airwaves. The door is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus. I hear you You're saying, but preacher, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what the church have done to me. I want to say to you, as we have on our marquee at the church right now, Jesus was hurt by the church, and he still comes to church. Jesus, the Christ, was hurt by the church, but he still comes to church. This is your moment. Don't miss your moment. You can get to know him right now right here just believe the story that Jesus died for your sins that he rose from the dead and the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 verse 9 and John 3 and 16 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 5 if you believe this story that Jesus died for your sins he was buried in a borrowed tomb he rose early that third day morning and he was seen first by Cephas, then by the 12 and then by over, over 500 men at one time. If you can just believe that story, you can be saved right here, right now. The door is open. The invitation is extended. If that's you, will you join me in prayer? Just repeat this simple prayer after me and you'll get to know Jesus. And he wants to be your savior. He wants to be your Lord. Regardless of what you've done, regardless of what you've been through, you need to get to know Jesus. Just repeat this simple prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. Amen and thank God. 
We believe if you trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're now born again. You're on your way to heaven. Your name is in the book of life. In the Lamb, God, Jesus, the Lamb book of life. And when you die, you're guaranteed to go to heaven. If you've received Christ today on, on this broadcast, please let me know by inboxing me. And, and let me know that you've received Jesus as your personal Savior. Also, if if you don't have a church home, I recommend this one, where Jesus is the center of attention and Jesus is the main attraction. The New Beginning Church is available to you, to minister to you, to undergird you even in times like these. If you need a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church. Inbox me and let me know that you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church. And also, if you need prayer, let me know you need to need prayer, and we'd be glad to, to pray with you and pray for you. We live in some tough times, but God is able to keep us in the midst of it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service here at the New Beginning Church. We're located at 4251 Shiremai Road, Houston, Texas. Our zip code is 77048. Uh, USA, Houston, Texas. Thank you so much. Please, ma'am, please, sir, join us this Sunday for communion. We will have communion at our 1045 service. We will we will have communion, virtual communion. Get your get your crackers, get your bread, get your 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 drink out, your your grape juice, get it out. And we want to break bread together. We will have a virtual communion celebration as we have for the last two months. We will celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, do this, for as often as you do this, you show forth my death and my suffering until I come again. Also, our church meeting is scheduled for tomorrow at 7 p.m., 7 p.m. Central Time. Our church meeting on Zoom, as well as the conference call, will take place at the same time. Zoom in the conference call. If you don't have the information, please call me, text me, and let me know. If you don't have the information, I'd like to hear from you. I'd like to check on everybody and make sure that everybody's doing well as we've been separated for two, three months. We want to make sure that you are doing well. Please come on the Zoom call as well as the conference call, and we will, we will uh, share our lives together. We're looking forward to having communion this Sunday, and we're also uh, looking forward to uh, our conference call on, on tomorrow. Amen. Again, it is offering time. It's time for us to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It's a good time to give to the Lord today. You can do so by three means. Uh, first of all, you can do so. You can give to the Lord by cash app. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. You can uh, give by our cash app. Our cash tag, NBC Souls, dollar sign, NBC Souls. You can give uh, to, to the New Beginning Church. Or you can mail your offering to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77489. Uh, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. And those of you who have Zelle, you can send your Zelle your Zelle contributions to lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. These are the three ways that you can give our church cash app, uh, dollar sign NBC Souls, uh, Zelle, uh, lifting.jesus at yahoo.com, and P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77549. Thank you so much for giving and so much for, for giving to us. That's 77459 is our zip code, Missouri City. Thank you for sharing with us tonight. We're glad that you've come to celebrate the conquering king of Calvary, Jesus himself. We want to encourage you in the Lord that God is still in control. He's still on his throne and he's still keeping us in spite of all that's going on around us. We serve the awesome and the amazing God. Please remember, next Wednesday we will begin with the book of Colossians. We finished Philippians. We will begin with the book of Colossians next week. 
And so please, ma'am, please, sir, read up, read up, do your homework on the book of Colossians so you can interact in our Bible study. Next week, we're in the book of Colossians. Praise the Lord for the privilege of walking through the word. The word is medicine to our flesh. And we thank God for the privilege of walking through his holy, his holy word. At the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. Let us go to God and pray. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy, your grace. We thank you for another privilege to come to you, Father God. We ask you to bless us as we have come. Bless your word to fall on good soil. Bless those who have heard that they will deliver the word to so many others. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise, just to allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. Now to him who is able, who is able to keep us from falling, now to him, the only wise, only true God, be dominion, be glory, and enthusiasm forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Thank God for this privilege of worshiping with you again.